ahead and get started. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you to this latest installment of the Crow Canyon webinar series. This particular talk is sponsored by the Hisatsunum chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society and Four Corners Lecture Series. It was planned back in the day. I asked Genevieve to do this talk in my role. Um, oh, I'm Carrie Schler. Sorry, didn't add that. I'm Carrie Schler, and I'm here in my role as vice president of the Hisatsunum chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society. And Genevieve was kind enough to agree to do this talk for us when, when it was going to be in person. Um, and then she was willing to change it, and we're so thrilled that Crow Canyon could host this online webinar, and hopefully we'll even get even more folks being able to, to see this talk than we would have if she was doing it in person in Cortez. So today we're going to talk about what we can learn from coiling and corrugation in southwestern ceramics with Genevieve Woodhead. Before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to thank that my slide's not advancing. Let's see. Maybe it's just being slow. I'd like to take a minute to thank uh, Taylor Hasbrock and Dylan Schwint, who's done an awful lot. They do all of the behind the scenes work here at Crow Canyon. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to thank them for, for that. And I'd also like to, uh, we wanna definitely make sure to acknowledge the Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for Humanities that have provided funding for Crow Canyon to host these webinars. So funding has provided, been provided by the Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act Economic Stabilization Plan of 2020. It's so wonderful that we can get this funding to allow Crow Canyon to host all of these webinars from a number of different organizations um, across the four corners. For those of you who are new to Zoom video conferencing, I want to go over a little bit of information about how this works. One thing that's really important is that you can move the little boxes of talking heads, like where Genevieve and I are right now, um, if we're, especially if we're, if we're covering up part of the PowerPoint that you'd like to be able to see, feel free to move those boxes around. And we're gonna to try to take all of your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you have a question, you can type that in the Q&A box. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Just click there and add in your question. And I'll ask those of Genevieve after she's done with her presentation. And if you're having any difficulties uh, with Zoom, you can head over and watch the presentation on Facebook Live at facebook.com backslash Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And finally, if you want to subscribe to us on YouTube, you can watch all of these great webinars that Crow Canyon's been hosting um, and, and see, see this webinar again next week once we, once we get that posted. So Crow Canyon Archaeological Center's mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. This webinar series is just such a wonderful way for us to be able to keep connected even when we're at a distance. If you'd like to learn more about Crow Canyon and programs that we offer, you can go to crowcanyon.org. I'd encourage you to do that. Um, we have two upcoming webinars that you can sign up for. Uh, next Thursday's webinar is Why Do We Call Them Kivas? with Steve Lexon, Susan Ryan, and Lyle Blinkwa. The following week, we have a talk um, called A Landscape Perspective on Climate with Colin Strawhacker and Grant Snickter. I said that right. Um, that's on Thursday, September 3rd. We also have gotten a number of requests through doing these webinars about folks that would like to help, um, especially native groups within the Four Corners region during this difficult, challenging time. Um, and these are a number of those organizations that would be really great to support if you're able. The Pueblo Relief Fund, the official Navajo Nation COVID Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, the Bluff Area Mutual Aid Fund, any of these things, any of these organizations would be great ways to support folks um, struggling, especially with the pandemic um, in the Four Corners region. So now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Genevieve and get us started with our presentation. 
Although she has instructed me to put up this slide because this is going to be fun. There's going to be an interactive um, part to this presentation. She wants me to let me let you know that there's going to be a hands-on activity in her presentation. So if you'd like to participate in that, grab a piece of paper um, and also a dark marker, and you'll be able to uh, participate in this hands-on activity in over the course of her presentation. Okay. It's very brief. <laughs> huh? It's very brief. <laughs> it'll, it'll be fun. I'm excited. I've got my paper. I'm excited. Okay, so uh, Genevieve Woodhead is a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico. She specializes in the archaeology of the northern U.S. Southwest. She researches ceramic manufacturing processes to better understand how learning operates and how people transmit knowledge and alter practices amidst demogra demographic fluctuations and dynamic interactions. We are so pleased she agreed to talk to us today on some of her MA research on corrugated pottery. So now I'll go ahead and let Genevieve take it away. Can, I, can you see everything? Looks good. Looks good, okay, great. Hello, first I'd like to say thank you to Carrie for that introduction and thank you to Taylor for organizing and to Dylan for the technical support. My name is Genevieve Woodhead and I'm a graduate student at the University of New Mexico where I study Northern US Southwest archeology. span I focus my research on the material practices of ancestral Puebloans prior to the arrival of the Spanish. However, the results of this project do speak to the effects of colonialism on practice and learning. I was a Crow Canyon intern in 2017, so I have benefited from those of you who donate to Crow Canyon, and I thank you. Before beginning, I want to recognize that I'm delivering this talk from the homeland of the 19 Pueblos of New Mexico and many formerly mobile Native American nations. I encourage non-Indigenous viewers to educate themselves about and learn about the land we live on and study. Tonight, I'll be discussing corrugated pottery. This talk complements other webinars in this summer series. Dr. Lexon discussed clapboarding and, co and corrugation, and Charles King and Russell Sanchez spoke about Pueblo and Potter's use, uh, uses of historical references and long-held ceramic practices. I completed my master's project a couple years ago on corrugated pottery. The main concern for that research was, how did pre-Hispanic Native American potters take clay paste as pictured on the left and produce a finished corrugated pot. This clay paste setup comes from a photo at Hopi Pueblo and the pot on the right comes from the Maxwell Museum. As I began to understand the corrugated vessel manufacture process, I found myself increasingly wondering, not only how do we get from a raw material to a finished product, but also how do we get from the sort of finished product pictured on the left to the sort of finished product pictured on the right? On the left, you see that same ancestral Pueblo and grayware vessel. Whereas this grayware vessel dates to sometime between 8900 and 1150, the Acoma pot on the right was likely produced sometime in the 1930s. The seller likened the 1930s pot to works by Lucy Lewis of Acoma Pueblo, but the identity of the artisan is not known for certain. So what can we learn from coiling and corrugation in Southwest ceramics? To answer that question, I've thought a lot about a slew of other questions. Corrugated vessels from the archeological record shed light on pottery making in the pre-Hispanic Southwest. But what is the relationship between archeological examples of corrugation and comparable historic and contemporary pots? What changed? And how do we explain apparent changes in ceramic production from the pre-Hispanic period to the historic period to today? I've already listed loads of questions we're thinking about, but this talk will generally trace two overarching questions in an attempt to get at what we can learn from pots with exposed coils and pots with corrugation. One, how did Southwest potters craft and build corrugated pots prior to the arrival of the Spanish and Anglos? And two, how have the practices responsible for pre-Hispanic corrugated pottery transformed into modern takes on corrugation, that is, how do historic and contemporary examples of Pueblo pottery differ from pre-Hispanic examples and why? 
I address the first question mostly through analysis of museum collections of coiled and corrugated ceramic coal vessels and experimental reconstruction and replication. I address the second question by referring to archival images of Native American potters, reading personal narratives and artist statements by Pueblo potters, and watching YouTube videos of Pueblo potters, including Rachel Sami Nampeo of Hopi Pueblo and Marvin Martinez of San Aldefonso Pueblo. You will see that the questions inform each other. And for that reason, this talk toggles between the archeological record and the historic period. Before going further, what is a corrugated pot? Corrugated pots are ubiquitous in the Northern Southwest. Potters gave corrugated vessels their characteristic undulating or shingled appearance by leaving the coiling method of construction exposed, only smoothing coils out on the interior of the vessel. Usually the process results in a spiral on the bottom of the vessel. Because the method of, of construction is exposed and unsmooth, corrugated vessels memorialize their own making. For this reason, one can treat ceramic attributes as indexical records of manufacture, as visible clues saying something about how ancestral Puebloan and Mugion people made these pots. Therefore, corrugated pots are useful for someone like me who wants to reconstruct the steps involved in manufacture. Everything is right there on the surface. I'll be speaking especially about the bases of these pots because of that resultant spiral that I mentioned. You can look at the base of a corrugated pot See that basal spot, spiral and know in which direction the potter built. Now, as we will come to see, you cannot detect which hand the potter used, but you can get an idea of the possible motions involved in building if you have the base to look at. I promise I'll talk more about hands later. Oh, here, here's the time for the activity. <laughs> I want to take a moment to work through some mental gymnastics for people who don't think about spirals as much as I do. We need to differentiate between the potter's coiling direction and the direction of the coil on the exterior of a pot. The two directions have, by necessity, an inverse relationship. A quick experiment reveals this. I encourage you to try it with me. Grab a thin piece of paper and a dark or permanent marker. Oh, you need both hands for this part. Okay. And then draw a spiral. And now here's an example that I did beforehand. You can see in these examples, I drew a counterclockwise spiral. Hopefully it doesn't flip the image. If you flip over the piece of paper, the bleed through image will show you a spiral going the opposite direction. That's going to happen every time you do that experiment. So flip the paper over and check that the resulting bleed through image is clockwise if you do a counterclockwise spiral like me. What we see on the basis of corrugated pots is equivalent to the bleed through image. It's a little funky, but it's also really important to keep in mind that inverse relationship between the action that is performed and the material manifestation of that action, the ceramic pot, and specifically its exterior base. Before launching into an investigation of actual pottery and before delving into replication, I made some predictions based on historic photographs and prior scholarship. Firstly, I predicted that when I did go to look at whole vessels uh, from the archeological assemblages, I would find that they mostly had counterclockwise bases. I predicted this because according to an initially limited survey of historic photographs of Pueblo potters, potters mostly adhered coils at the close side of the vessel, pinching and securing the coil with their right hands, feeding the coil with their left hands. Viewed from the front, the coil would move from the right to the left as the potter built. Many of these potters were photographed by white men like Edward S. Curtis and William Henry Jackson. We've got an image here from Adam C. Roman. These photographers are known or rumored to have stage photographs. However, a Pueblo potter would likely take on the building setup and configuration she's most com comfortable with, even in a staged photograph. You can also see these photos, uh, these pots and these photos are not corrugated pots. Historic and contemporary Pueblo potters primarily obliterate in smooth coils. On the left, you see Nampeo of Hopi, in the middle, Zioni of Zia, and on the right, an unnamed Zuni potter. 
These three potters and most historic period Pueblo potters produce a different type of pot for the most part. The hand motions at the very beginning when making the base of a smooth pot would be different from the hand motions involved in making the base of a pot with exposed coiling. However, when building the upper body of the vessel, historic Pueblo potters do employ the same sorts of motor skills as pre-Hispanic Native American potters in the Southwest would have when coiling and corrugating pottery. The initial prediction that most pots would have counterclockwise bases makes intuitive sense. One would assume, A, potters want to work on the close side of a vessel and see what they are doing. B, given that most people are right-handed and given that right-handed people like to use their right hand to accomplish tasks involving fine motor skills, then the right hand would likely be doing the pinching, adhering, clay smoothing work while the left hand steers the coil. So I had an expectation for what the bases of the pre-Hispanic pots might look like, but I also had an idea of what the bodies of the pre-Hispanic pots would look like given their bases. Anthropologist uh, Edward Twitchell Hall Jr. made corrugated pottery the subject of his 1932 master's thesis, The Distribution of Indented Pottery in the Southwest. Hall asserted that pots with clockwise exterior bases have body indentations moving down to the left, as indicated in this illustration. Hall also asserted that these sorts of pots were produced through left hand pinching. Conversely, Hall maintained that pots with counterclockwise exterior bases and body indentations moving down to the right were produced through pinching with the right hand. Hall did not thoroughly explain how he concluded which base and which indentation angle went with which hand. He did make it clear that he was assuming potters pinched with their thumbs at the close side of the vessel, a reasonable assumption given my own research into archival images of potters. From his study, he found the number of pots purportedly produced through left-hand pinching far exceeded the population of left-handed people, generally thought to be somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of a population. Hall stated, as a whole, pinching done, pinching with the right hand is an exception rather than the rule. And this is significant on its face value. If your handedness doesn't explain how you're building a pot, then the explanation is probably going to be cultural. If your handedness doesn't explain which direction you build in, then the explanation is probably going to be cultural, which brings us to the issue of handedness. The current belief is genetics is the primary determinant of hand dominance, but psychology, education, and archaeology research suggest that people learning crafts or new skills flexibly adapt their own hand motions and hand configuration to match that of their teachers or that of the person demonstrating the skill. This seems to be especially true of complicated tasks involving both hands. For example, archaeologist Jill Miner concluded hand dominance biases do not determine a cordage spinner's spinning direction. Rather, most thigh and spindle spinners work in a given direction because that was how they learned to do it from their teachers. Hall's work with archaeological examples of corrugated pots could support the same conclusion that Miner came to. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee that someone will build at the close side of the pot, pinching with their thumbs. This complicates or even invalidates Hall's conclusions and calls into question what exactly we can learn from coiling and corrugation in Southwest ceramics. In 1983, David Snow posited that there are multiple ways to coil a pot and both hands can be responsible for either coiling direction. As I looked at more photos and footage of historic and contemporary Pueblo and non-Pueblo potters, I saw examples of people pinching at the far side of the vessel. Therefore, we cannot assume all potters across the whole of the Southwest pinched with their thumbs at the close side of the vessel. We cannot even assume people pinched with their dominant hand. There are examples of non-Native American potters who practice corrugation and choose to feed coils with their dominant hand. This illustration demonstrates that pinching at the far side of the vessel with your forefinger might result in the same overall appearance using the opposite hand. The hand and building configuration shown in A and D might result in the same overall appearance. In terms of basal spirals, pots A and D would be 
in, in identical. Ergonomics suggests pots in A and D would also look the same in terms of indentation angles. And the same goes for B and C. The fact that different hands might produce the same spirals and indentations left me wondering, could we even tell which hand a potter used to pinch? I figured experiments with replication would be necessary, but I looked for the same relationships between coiling direction and indentation angles as Hall looked for. Hall recognized that if handedness didn't explain a potter's coiling direction, then some other likely cultural factor must explain coiling direction. And yet Hall relied heavily on inferential relationships and on treating certain assumptions as self-evident. Assumptions like working at the close side of a, a pot with the thumbs. If an observable relationship does exist between indentation angle and coiling direction, then researchers can consider making inferences regarding topics like symbolism, practice, and learning. I decided to check the relationships I predicted from photographs in the relationships Hall described primarily from analyzing fragments and sherds with a study of whole pots. To understand how pre-Hispanic corrugated pots were made, I looked at an assortment of whole vessel examples from the collections of the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, and the University of Colorado Boulder Natural History Museum. I primarily worked with collections of ancestral Pueblo graywares. Graywares were the focus of prior research like that by Edward Hall and David Snow. Grayware is a utility ware with a wide geographic extent. Textured graywares were most popular from the 8900s to the 8200s. If you volunteer at or visit Crow Canyon, you've surely seen neck banded and corrugated grayware usually from jars. Some people believe that the distinctive appearance of corrugated graywares is tightly linked to their primary function as cooking vessels. In his 1999 dissertation, Christopher Pierce found that neck corrugation seems to prevent boil overs and that all over corrugation seems to reduce thermal shock and prevent crack propagation. Although cooking pots comprise the majority of the museum collections, there are black on white painted bowls with exterior corrugation, though they are relatively rare. Besides being practical, corrugation has an undeniable aesthetic value. It really does look cool. And more importantly, there may be symbolic meaning behind corrugation that I cannot see from my position as a white scholar living in the 21st century. Brownware corrugated serving vessels are much more common than whiteware ones. These pots, usually bowls, were not for cooking. Typically, these vessels come from the Maguillon region of New Mexico and Arizona. They are red or brown in color. They have narrow coils and lightly polished exterior corrugation with highly polished black interiors. I looked at hundreds of pots, seeking to check Hall's prediction that certain spirals were necessarily accompanied by certain indentation angles. Plus, I wanted to check my prediction that most pots would have counterclockwise bases. To meet both of these goals, and to best understand how pre-Hispanic corrugated pots were made, I recorded three main attributes when looking at a pot. The corrugation type, the resultant spiral on the exterior vessel base, and the angle of indentations. I recorded coiling and corrugation type as one of five possibilities. Indented, clapboard, flattened, round or rope-like, and finally, multiple corrugation or coiling types. Potters might distinctly switch from indented coils to clapboard coils, or potters might ease into one from the other with less distinctiveness. Of course, there were no angles of indentation on pots without indentations. I noticed that the direction in which a potter built could also be observed not only from vessel bases, but from looking at coil terminations and transitions in decorative coiling styles. I would look for places where one coil ended and a new coil resumed movement. One coil ends and another starts right on top of it. Generally, no attempt is made to disguise this fact. 
I think it would get messy or the pot would become weak if you did try to blend new coils in with the ends of old coils. Acknowledging this fact of manufacture and not disguising it might also have some aesthetic, symbolic, or ideological meaning indiscernible to an outsider. Here's a comparative example of how our Western mindset biases what we deem aesthetically pleasing. The Japanese art of kintsugi involves repairing objects with gold lacquer or gold powder. The gold draws attention to cracks and breaks. This practice goes hand in hand with a philosophy of treating repair, even decay, as something worthy of acknowledgement. Similarly, the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi embraces the handmade qualities of objects. These are just cro these are cross-cultural examples to illustrate that visible coil transitions were not necessarily something to disguise and could be something worth highlighting. So returning to the archaeological examples of corrugation, coiling direction as indicated by the vessel base matches the building direction as indicated by coil overlaps and decorative zones. In these cases, the pots had clockwise bases suggesting a left to right building direction when viewed from the front. The, coiling the coil overlap and transitions confirm this. Look at the lowest clapboard coil of this central vessel. Trace the coil's movement, noting where indented coiling transition transitions into clapboard coiling. The topmost clapboard coil then transitions in the same direction out of clapboard coiling and back into indentation, there is left to right movement. Note the direction of the red arrows. The same goes for the coil overlap example on the right. Left to right movement goes hand in hand with clockwise bases. And this works with both building and coiling directions, as long as the potter is consistent. The pots on the previous slide had clockwise base spirals. In this case, Indenting moves from right to left. Note how the, the indenting moves from right, left into clapboard, and then at the topmost clapboard coil, out of clapboard coiling and back in the indentation from the right to the left. So this pot has a counterclockwise basal spiral. It works both ways. To comprehend the intricacies of how to make a corrugated pot and to see whether corrugated pottery was truly a quote unquote legible artifact, I decided to attempt replication with the full awareness that I'm learning as an adult and I'm learning as a white person centuries later. I learned about contemporary artisanal Pueblo pottery making from UNM professor Clarence Cruz of Okeo Wenge Pueblo. I also visited Dr. Eric Blinman at the Center for New Mexico Archaeology. Blinman had timed replication experiments and found corrugation to be faster than smoothing. Efficiency commonly explains motor habits, so I wanted Blinman's input reg regarding the pace of coiling. Blinman also corrugates pots entirely by hand, and his replications result in intact basal spirals. Blinman agreed to attempt alternate technical styles, that is, different combinations of choices at different points in the process of making a corrugated pot. Starting a corrugated pot was the hardest part. The center base patty of clay is tough to make and easy to ruin. Even in this example here, I had to go back and incise where that central spiral was. You can also see the inside of the, of the pot base patty is cracking along coil joints. In the beginning, the potter builds with the base patty aloft, not yet resting in a curved, supportive plate known as a hudizi or puki. When the basal portion reaches a certain size, the potter moves it to a supportive plate. In some cases, traces of this transition are visible because the coiling changes in appearance or because the pot ripples and bulges from the opposing pressure of the plate and the potter's hands. In other cases, a potter may exaggerate or draw attention to differences in the appearance of the basal spiral by making the initial coil thicker or leaving it unindented. I learned from experimenting that one can easily obliterate the basal spiral while building. I had to work carefully to preserve that spiral. When I transitioned out of handheld building, I needed the aid of a puki to build efficiently without destroying the basal spiral. 
Replicas generally match the relationships earlier scholars like Hall and Snow propose for coils and indentations. 12 out of 14 combinations that I tried matched for the predicted indentation direction. Ultimately, the exercise showed corrugated pottery is not entirely legible. There is a lot of room for idiosyncratic variation. Importantly, several iterations resulted in the same overall appearance. That is, both hands could produce the same basal spirals and indentation angles, making detection of hand use impossible. Working out the potential combinations of choices a potter might make is complex. That's why I had 14 iterations, and that's still not exhaustive of all the choices a pre-Hispanic potter can make. And many of these choices exist independently. That is, one choice may or may not affect other choices. So how was a pre-Hispanic corrugated pot made? Well, there are many ways a potter might make a corrugated pot. That's what replication shows. A potter can work with the inside or the outside of the starting base patty facing up. That's one choice. A potter can work along the near or far edge of the vessel using the thumb or index finger to pinch indentations. A potter can work with the left or right hand doing the pinching or the coil feeding, adding coils in a counterclockwise or clockwise motion. But here's the thing. Even though the possibility of idiosyncratic variation seems infinite, an expert potter would not be likely to explore variation. Blinman states hand motions in pottery making are remarkably resistant to change. As a potter, Blinman was uncomfortable exploring styles and expertly. When adding new coils, his impulse was to revert back to the technique he had mastered. He said he had trouble achieving a rhythm. From a practical standpoint, altering how you make a pot is inefficient. With these insights from replication, it was clear that if ancestral Puebloan and muggy owned potters had particular or preferred ways of making corrugated pottery, then I'd have to statistically evaluate the archeological examples to identify any preferences. Because different hand motions can result in the same overall appearance, archeological examples could belie variation in hand motions, but not in building direction. My goal was to learn more about corrugated pottery and more about the ancestral Puebloan and Muggion people who made it. Otherwise, the doors open for scholars to either largely ignore corrugated pottery or make not wholly supported inferences as to handedness, symbolism, so on. The results of the study of archeological examples of whole pots with exposed coiling and corrugation showed that out of 251 pots with good clear base spirals, 227 had clockwise bases as opposed to 24 counterclockwise base pots. Remember way back at the beginning of this talk, I predicted counterclockwise base pots would be the majority. Hall, Edward Hall, hinted that I'd be wrong when he said pinching with the right hand thumb was the exception. Um, left hand, yeah, right hand thumb was the exception. And while it is remarkable that these percentages mirror the population of lefties to righties, I don't make anything of that right now. From observation alone, I cannot know which hand a potter used to build, let alone a potter's dominant hand. Exposure to potters, exposure to research by people like Jill Miner, and my own replication experiments showed we cannot have certainty as to handedness or hand use. Of the indented corrugated pots, a total of 143 pots had down to left body indentations versus 27 with down to right body indentations. 15 pots had multiple or combined indentation angles in a way that made me think assured from one part of, a, of, that, of those pots would not look like assured from another. Counts show. Exterior base coil direction and indentation angle are associated, not independent traits. You can tell just by looking at this table, they are related. But let's go over it. 
140 clockwise base pots had down to left indentations as predicted by Hall, but 11 had down to right indentations. 16 counterclockwise base pots had down to right indentations as predicted, but three had down to left indentations. Many more clockwise base pots had down to left indentations. Some more counterclockwise base pots had down to right indentations. Edward Hall's predicted relationships between base spirals and body indentations do hold up. However, there's clearly no one-to-one -one relationship between indentation angle and coiling direction because these cells each have some pots. Plus there were 15 pots with multiple indentation angles. Coiling direction and indentation angle are associated just not invariably so. For that reason, indentation angles, say on sherds, if you're in the field and you wanna apply this talk, they're not a perfect, maybe not even an appropriate proxy for coiling direction or manufacturing methods. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. They're not a perfect one-to-one -one match between coil clockwise bases and down the left and counterclockwise and down the right. The archaeological sample of pottery with exposed coils and corrugation was mostly pots with clockwise spirals on their base exteriors. This means pre-Hispanic Native American potters in the Southwest responsible for pots in the sample mostly adhered coils in a counterclockwise manner, working from left to right if faced frontally. This is noteworthy. Although replication showed room for idiosyncrasy, replication overwhelmingly supported the ergonomic realities of coiling. There are two ways you can efficiently get pots that look like 90% of the archeological sample uh, examples. And by efficiently, I mean both hands are at work, so you're working quickly and no hand is going, uh, is, is repeating the job that another hand could do. You can one, one, you can adhere coils at the close side indenting with your left hand's thumb. The left image of Akama Potter, Jackie Shativa, shows what this configuration would look like. This image comes from a book called Earth Daughter, Alicia of Akama. It's a really good book. The image on the right shows the other method for efficiently making a pot that looks like 90% of the archeological uh, examples. In this set setup, you adhere coils at the far side, indenting with your right hand index finger or maybe middle finger. Based on historic photographs of Pueblo potters, potters commonly adhered coils by pinching with the right hand at the close side of the pot, feeding the coil with the left hand and building in a clockwise manner. Note the images of unnamed potters from Zuni and San Aldefonso. If these two potters left their pots unsmoothed, they'd make pots with counterclockwise bases. If left unsmoothed, most historic pots would have counterclockwise bases. At the beginning of this talk, I used images of historic Pueblo potters to predict which base would be more common among pre-Hispanic pots. I predicted clockwise bases, and I was wrong. YouTube videos by Native American potters, as well as books, exhibit catalogs, and first-person narratives geared toward young readers, suggests certain commonalities among historic and contemporary Pueblo and potters' tales of how they came to learn pottery making. A skilled potter, usually a woman, allows children or youth, usually her kin, to watch her build. The novice initially learns through observation, and yet skilled adult potters encourage independent learning and autodidacticism. An untrained individual is typically wary, even afraid to work with clay or hold fragile pots. At a point, a novice usually engages in what is termed trial and error learning in the fields of education and management sciences. Trial and error learning refers to any instance in which a learner experiments and adopts experimental actions if the outcomes are successful. A trial and error learner taps into prior knowledge acquired through any number of learning methods, including observation and past experiments, and then tries other alternatives. Pueblo potters like Marvin Martinez, Daisy Huinampeo, and Priscilla Naminga 
Nampeo, describe receiving guidance and aid from skilled adults. But Pueblo potters also experiment with new trials. Note on the right Dolores Luis Garcia and Mela Youngblood describing their trial and error process and how they take their time in an effort to achieve variety and high quality. Trial and error learning does not result in conservative hand movements resistant to change. I'd like now to revisit those historic photographs from the beginning of the talk, the images of Nampeo, Sione, and the unnamed Zuni potter. I said at the outset, based on a survey of photographs, most Pueblo potters seem to work at the close side of the vessel, adhering the coil with the right hand, feeding the coil with the left hand. That was true of most Pueblo potters, but not all. Here are photographs of Maria Martinez, Lucy Lewis, Dolly Naranjo, and unnamed potters from Hopi. The potters would have made pots with clockwise bases were they to leave the coils visible on their vessel exteriors. In instances of trial and error learning, you get more variability in the techniques and order of techniques used to produce something than you do when learning is highly formalized, guided, and reinforced daily. Right now, I have a small sample of images of Native American potters at work, but nev nevertheless, nevertheless, the split among what would be the base spiral direction of modern potters' pots is more like 33% clockwise bases to 67% counterclockwise. This contrasts with the 90% to 10% split for pre-Hispanic pots. The different levels of consistency between the primarily clockwise based pots of the past and the more variable pots of the present might be due in part to sampling and the period of time covered. In many ways, these two samples are different. Still, something is being captured by the discrepancy. Coiling and corrugation in Southwest ceramics teaches us that typically conservative motor habits are subject to change. Early stage ceramic shaping choices are generally conservative because they are practiced so regularly that they become part of a potter's subconscious muscle memory. This study's archaeological sample suggests that this is true for building direction in ancestral Puebloan and Maguillon coiled pots. At some point, a change in the seemingly conservative choice of building direction took place. Historical events and related changes in learning context and learning mode affected pottery making. It's widely known that European colonizers greatly impacted the lifestyles of indigenous communities. The effects of colonization continue to influence cultural processes, including those for transmitting pottery making knowledge. The number of potters declined in the historic period. Many Pueblo potters talk about actively revitalizing pottery making in their Pueblos and in their community. Hopi potter Bobby Silas says his focus is on reviving 14th and 17th century Sikiyaki pottery style. King Galleries carries his pottery. In the 1970s, Lucy Year Flower Tafoya from Powake Pueblo said, quote, she was the only one making pottery and, quote, wanted to bring pottery making back as there is originally one potter from Powake. Contemporary Pueblo, contemporary potters who recreate the look of corrugated pottery, do so in a manner conducive to the production of beautiful art pieces, but at odds with the demands of pr producing a utility good. The pot on the left has some unsmooth coiling, a sign of building quickly. It also has soot deposits. Both of these qualities relate to the pot's role as a utilitarian cooking vessel. As a mode for constructing utilitarian ceramics, Corrugation dropped off before the arrival of the Spanish. Its production began declining by the 14th century with all production ceasing in the late 17th century. 20th and 21st century potters have taken up corrugation to an extent. When Lucy Lewis would make a corrugated pot, she'd add between four and six coils, thin coils, before returning to indent with a pointed cedar tool. Sometimes Lewis would task indenting to another person like her daughter, Dolores, pictured here. This Jesse Garcia pot sold by King Galleries looks to have been indented with a similar sort of tool. And replication artist Clint Swink also places coils down, then goes back and indents. The point is, in these contemporary cases, a stop and go 
lay down coil then indent process is time consuming because potters go over everything at least twice. Tool use too will add extra labor and tool use changes the hand configuration and motor skills involved in producing corrugated pottery. There are differences in the manufacture of modern corrugated pots, but the connection to corrugated pottery of the past is still there. In an exhibition catalog, Dolores Luis Garcia, Lucy Lewis's daughter, recalls her and her family researching pottery designs in books and at museums. Charles King and Russell Sanchez discuss this sort of historical connection in their webinar. Corrugation as a practice may have fallen out of use before the arrival of the Spanish. In the end though, Pueblo and potters maintain this unique ceramic craft and technique. In conclusion, by visually inspecting a large archeological sample of coiled and corrugated whole vessels, I found that most pre-Hispanic pots with exposed coils and corrugation exhibit clockwise basal spirals. Potters responsible for these vessels likely coiled either with their left hand pinching at the close side of the vessel or their right hand pinching at the far side of the vessel, working in a counterclockwise motion. Ancestral Puebloan and Maguillon potters could have employed other hand configurations. Coiling direction in and of itself does not speak to hand use or hand dominance. By and large, indentation angle is associated with coiling direction, but if future researchers want to use fragments of coiled pots to infer something about coiling direction, then they must understand that indentation angle is not a perfect proxy, perhaps not an appropriate one. According to photos and video footage, historic and contemporary Pueblo potters exhibit less consistency in coiling direction when compared to pre-Hispanic Native American potters of the Southwest. Changes in learning modes might explain a shift from consistently counterclockwise pre-Hispanic coiling to more variable, but generally clockwise coiling in more recent times. We can learn a great deal from pottery with exposed coils and corrugation. However, there exists tension between what is legible and what is elusive about these vessels and their traces of their own making. I wanna thank you for having me. I appreciate everyone who helped me. I thank the Archaeological Society of New Mexico uh, for funding a visit to Boulder. I thank all the museums who opened their doors to me as well, the Maxwell Museum, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, and the University of Colorado Boulder Natural History Museum. And then these are some of the sources I referenced and, Im and used images from in this talk. Of course, I use many more as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Genevieve. This was so interesting. I'm glad that you were able to, to give us the presentation today. I mean, I'm gonna, let me share my video so that we can have a little conversation about some of the questions that have come in. People are okay. really, there's a number of people that are interested and um, are interested in the, the project that you've done here. Um, a couple of questions. Well, maybe even, could you talk a little bit more about the samples of archeological pots that you looked at? Were you able to, in the sampling, look at different pots from different um, parts of the Northern Southwest? So in the, within the Pueblo sample, were you able to look at things from Mesa Verde and from Chaco? Yeah. Okay, so so did you look from all, like the whole, wide, a number of questions came in of like, well, what percentage yeah. were, um, were from different areas? So could you talk a little bit more about yeah. your samples? I'll talk more about that. Um, I So when I did the project, just some background, I was a second year graduate student. So definitely not fully capable of typing all ceramic pottery from the whole of the Southwest. So I basically went into museums and pulled all the whole pots that had coils that I could see. Um, and I, and I took, and I took the types that were used from the museums, but in speaking with collections managers, a uh, few of them have tons of confidence in the typing that have been done by others over time. But, um, and I, and I'm going to make this the subject of a, a paper I have in manuscript, but, um, I did look at them by general tra tradition, and the trend is always, always consistently clockwise bases. 
the only guys that stand out for being having a higher. So these are all the areas I looked at. Um, you can see the indeterminate numbers are kind of large as well. Um, the monkey own are a lot easier to type. Um, but the northern San Juan, the, where oops, where Crow Canyon is, has uh, oddly more um, counterclockwise based pots than anywhere else, given the size of the sample. I mean, my Chuska sample looks wacky, but there's only five pots there. So mm -hmm. those are the two that stand out for having uh, a statistically significantly larger amount of counterclockwise based pots. And then the Mugion stands out for being significantly, uh, or especially clockwise. But by and large, oh, you can expect to find a clockwise base on a pot mm -hmm. with exposed coils. And I, I don't know if the same goes for smooth coils. Right, okay, oh, no, that's great. Okay, what other questions do we have? Um, there were a couple of questions about the patterning in, coil, in corrugation and coiling. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on why potters did that? Is the it pattern? just artistic? What, what do you, yeah. I, I guess my thought would be, why don't I go to a pretty picture of one that's patterned? I did record um, the patterns when I noticed them, but I do think they are, um, I think they're probably primarily aesthetic, but you know, that's just my guess. Um, they're beautiful. They do mimic basketry. So that's, that's an idea is that they mimic the designs in basketry. This one's especially neat how it's got these zigzags uh -huh. that go like this. I've seen, I, I've seen a pot that was a whiteware bowl that had just triangles where they had not smoothed out the indentation. So that was an interesting example because it means they coiled the whole pot with indentations and smooth at the very end. But I do think the patterns are um, primarily decorative. I, I, and, and some people dispute even the function that Christopher Pierce um, identified for coiling. Um, there's one thing more I wanted to say about that. I, it would be, in my mind, maybe challenging to do a design if you're not looking, if you're working at the far side of the pot. So the patterning might be evidence for working at the close side of the pot. True. Uh, that's a good point. Cool. Okay. Um, uh, there's a couple of comments and about um, the composition of the clay being a, a factor in, in how thick you make the coils. Um, as well as coil length and those sorts of things. Did any of your research, uh, especially your experimental research, uh, indicate that the, the type of clay and quality of the clay um, is, is, is it better for making corrugated pots versus non-corrugated pots, certain well, kinds of clays? These grayware pots have very coarse uh, temper, which helps with some of those same uh, sort of cooking qualities that the indentations might help with. It helps with um, uh, resistance to thermal shock. And, and so that's something you, you, why, that's a reason why you'd want coarse temper. I didn't take, um, clay sample from all the places that I looked at pots from, but I've, I've found personally, um, that when working with, a, a clay that has a lot of temper, it does become short, meaning it, it can, it can crumble. So I, I would find it challenging to make some of these coils are very long, uh, mm -hmm. so that's it's pretty impressive how long they are. Um, I don't think I don't know of any reason why it would make it easier to make a long coil. Okay. Um, Lawrence Strauss wants to know: Is corrugation found in ceramic traditions outside of the U.S. Southwest that uh -huh. you're aware of? So not in the way that I see here. Excuse all the flipping. <laughs> um, but I, and I haven't looked, I haven't seen pots from other areas, but you know, let me just close and then open again. I put up this slide because it is curious to me that there is pottery that looks very similar from other areas. I haven't personally seen any um, pottery like this. These are Bell Beaker Complex and Corded Ware Culture pots. So they're, they're made with, um, they say, People, I, I, I'm not a European archaeologist, but they say it's from indenting with a coil or impressing the pot with a cordage. 
However, I mean, this, this example here looks like an exposed coil. I haven't seen this shirt in person. I haven't seen this pot in person and I can't zoom in closely, but it sure does look similar. And it seems like at the very least, other cultures, especially in Europe and Africa, as far as I know, do something that accomplishes that same amount of surface texture, whether that's with cordage impression or leaving an unindented or unsmooth coils, I, I'm not quite sure. So that these authors go into the chemical composition of these pots, but nobody clarifies for sure that they're made right. with cordage impressions, but I, I believe that's how they're made. Oh, that's great. Um, there's another question about the practical reasons for making corrugated pots that you sort of alluded to, but I think some people don't know the, the, that um, uh, some of the studies that have been done about the practical uh, purposes of po possible practical purposes of corrugated pots. And someone even would like uh, the Chris Pierce uh, reference. And I don't, um, if you wanted to talk, do you want to talk a little bit more about um, what uh, if you, uh, you want to talk a little bit about Chris Pierce's findings with corrugated pots. Right. So uh, Chris Pierce hired Clint Sweet, who I mentioned, or I don't know if he hired him. With Clint Sweet's help, help he made um, pots that were the same volume about and wall thickness with um, sm smooth vessel walls, pots that had neck corrugation and neck coiling, and then pots that had overall corrugation and did different tests exposing them to um, the sort of trauma that a cooking pot would experience. And it seems that the neck corrugation particularly, so there are some pots um, that have smooth bases and then neck banding, and then there are some pots that have smooth bases and neck corrugation. So those pots did well in terms of preventing boil overs. If you're doing a long and slow simmer of um, a hearty grain that you need to increase the uh, um, nutritional uh, qualities of, that would be great. You don't want it to boil over, you want it to boil slowly and not have to watch your boiling pot the whole time. Uh, but And he also found that the all, overall corrugation prevented cracks from propagating. And I think the logic is, if a crack starts in one of these coils from repeated heating and cooling, if a crack starts, it'll meet one of these, it'll travel and meet one of these corrugated uh, ridges and it won't go any further because it's hit this wall that doesn't allow it to progress farther along the pot. Absolutely. So, and if anybody's interested in, in getting that, you can actually Google Chris Pierce dissertation um, and you can get a PDF of that. So it, it's called Explaining Corrugated Pottery in the American Southwest. Um, and it dates to the 1999. In addition, uh, I think there's um, Michael Schiffer. A number of the comments are coming in that Michael Schiffer sort of had some, some different ideas about the corrugated um, vessels and impact resistance. So um, that's also, I think, in your references, right? Let's the see. Pierce is here. The Pierce is there. Okay. Not the Schiffer. And I know others have done work, too, on it. Yeah. Blinman cites them, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let me go back to the question. Sorry. Okay. So we already did the Bronze Age one. Bronze Age one. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Were you able to identify objects used other than fingers to produce indentations? Were you able to tell how that how many of those indentations were done that weren't just with fingers? I didn't see tool use in the archaeological sample at all, actually. Um, I usually saw signs of fingerprints. They weren't typically great. Uh, you know, they'd be just a portion of your finger, and we don't know what portion. Um, and I'd see often I'd see cuticles cuticle impressions or impressions from the point where your nail joins your finger. But I don't think I ever saw a tool. Oh, well, I actually, that's not true. I, well, I saw signs of incising with a tool. There's okay. one pot here that I really like it. Um, where is it? This one is good. This one has little, these squiggles across. Oh, neat. Which is a, it's a neat one. So I did see inc incisions. And then the Mugion pottery would be um, 
lightly polished with a polishing stone probably. So I actually didn't see fingerprints in that. Great. Cool. A prison. Awesome. Okay. Well, there's one, there's one last question, I guess I will ask. Well, there's two more questions. Uh, one is, can you address cord marked versus corrugation? Like what, what's the difference there? And um, did you see any cord marked pottery in your sample? In this sample, I didn't see any sides of, yeah, cord marked or cord impressed. So that, that's the kind of what the European examples are supposed, are made with is, is impressing cord. And there is, there is cord impressed pottery in the Southwest. And there's also, um, oh my gosh, I think Earl Morris, I think, um, hypothesized that, um, people in the Southwest figured out, I'm gonna fire pots because they had clay lined baskets. So that's not cordage, but it's another perishable material that got hot and uh, from their use and that burnt the clay. And then they realized, oh, we can, we can do this intentionally as well because there are archeo archeological examples of baskets with burnt and even fully fired, I guess, maybe not fully fired, but fired clay inside of them. And like been impressed. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can tell in person, you'd be able to tell the difference because the, the corrugated pottery indented with your finger is less regular and you do see signs of fingerprints. And then the cord impressed pottery is very regular. And what you'll see is the reverse image of the S or Z cordage twist that the whoever spun the cordage um, used. And, and you and it's usually a lot narrower. Okay, great, great. Well, thank you, Genevieve. I guess there's one last question, which you know maybe is your mom. I don't know. It says, "When is the publication coming out?" <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Actually, I I told my advisor I'm setting aside this weekend. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta get my act together. <laughs> It'll be soon. <laughs> Coming soon. Awesome. Yeah. With well, even more you. images. <laughs> thank you so much, Genevieve. Um, and uh, everybody, please turn in, tune in next week for uh, the the presentation on Kivas. And keep keep coming back. We're, we appreciate you uh, spending your Thursday afternoon with us. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you. <laughs>